This is the Growlers Nation podcast, the official podcast of the Newfoundland Growlers. And now here's your host, Growlers play-by-play voice, Chris Ballard. And welcome to episode five of the Growlers Nation podcast. I'm Chris Ballard. Play-by-play voice of the Newfoundland Growlers. So happy to have you aboard and so thankful uh, for all your support uh, through the first four episodes. And uh, we've got a fun special guest lined up here for today. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Hockey Hall of Famer, ECHL Hall of Famer in the pride of Cornerbrook, Newfoundland and Labrador. We're jumping right in today with the legend Darren Colborn. Darren, uh, thanks for jumping on today. More than excited to be here, uh, Chris. I've uh, been a big fan of the Growlers and your uh, and your work, so uh, it's a real pleasure. Awesome. Well, I definitely appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, what was your first reaction? We're going to go back to the, the dog days of the dogs here, the Growlers. What was your reaction when you heard St. John's might be getting an ECHL franchise, obviously having played in that league for as long as uh, you have? What, was your, what first came to mind when you heard uh, the Buys might be getting a franchise here in town? Well, again, I, I just thought that, you know, thinking way back when, how much the league has grown. Um, you're talking, uh, it used to be the East Coast Hockey League where it was uh, just merely, uh, you know, southern U.S., a little bit of northern U.S., and somewhere to the Midwest. Then it jumped to the, all the way to the West. You know, then it comes all the way to northern Canada in Newfoundland. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> but, uh, again, it's just uh, it's mind-blowing to see the size of that league. Um, and it's so exciting for St. John's. I know it's taken a bit of time for it to catch on because, uh, honestly, Chris, they've been the spoiled bunch out there. They, they've had some great hockey teams. That's true. Great hockey. Um, and to see the AHL and, you know, that whether they think they took a step back or we think we took a step back from the A to the, to the ECHL, it's all relative to what you're seeing. And, and again, I think you're seeing some fine talent coming through and, uh, they struck a struck a good uh, note with with the Maple Leafs because I think they are uh, going with that baseball style of double A, triple A type thing, and that's they right. are going to see some great hockey players there. And, and that's great to see that they are sending their young kids there because that's what people want to see. No, exactly. People want to see the up and comers. Those up and comers want top line minutes that they're not going to get in the American League. So doesn't it make sense if you're trying to groom a top end guy to give him top end minutes in a place where he can thrive? That seems to be the model. Yeah, and again, I looked just just a couple of days ago uh, through all his hard work and 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 dedication. Zach O'Brien gets his shot to move up to the A. So that's what it, it's it's twofold. It's it's up and down. So. Um, you know, I, I hope for Zach's sake he stays up there, but I hope for the Growlers' sake he doesn't. You know, it's because uh, when when you're uh, you know when you're cheering for a team, uh, you don't want to lose someone. But in the end, that's what this league is about. The ECHL is about growth, uh, whether it be coaching, uh, guys moving up in the uh, like yourself, getting an opportunity to move to the next level, and the players. Uh, players are there for a reason, and they know what they're there for. They're they're there for they're either at the end of it or they're at the beginning of it, and uh, you know that's that's. That's what it's all about. So uh, you wish anybody in, uh, who, who does the dog, like we just discussed about the dog days of uh, the early schedule where they oh, have to yes. get on a bus for two or three days. Uh, you tap anybody on the back for that, and if they get the opportunity to move up on the upper level, all the power. No, oh, hey, absolutely. And so what was your reaction? Obviously, everyone in the province simply welled with pride when the Growlers actually finished off the Toledo Walleye last June. You, again, being a native Newfoundlander and maybe the, the Newfoundlander who's uh, most familiar with uh, the ECHL, uh, what was your reaction? First uh, pro championship back home, ECHL, put it all together and how that hit you. Kind of jealous, actually, because uh, <laughs> I spent I spent five or six years in that league, or you know, four hundred and uh, four hundred odd games, and uh, you know, I never got past the second round. So it, it is it is a league that's very tough to get through. Yeah. Um, with respect to uh, to winning it all, uh, let alone doing it in your first year, like that, that blows my mind that uh, uh, they were able to pull that off. Now it's you know they had great support from. Uh, from the, the parent club, and uh, but again, it was it was it was. I tell you, it was it was that same group of guys that got the job done. It's not like they had a an influx of guys that came in and just turned it up a notch. Those guys battled it out, battled it out all year. They For were sure. they were there, and, and I got to see quite a few games and and the growth and the consistency and having to deal with uh, with uh, Chloe's departure and, yeah. and, and John John's ability to uh, to take it uh, in his direction. And and keep the, the focus 
Uh, but yeah, the fact that they won that last year, uh, again, I was beaming because I'm going to brag a little bit. I, I, I said right from day one that they were going to be a contender because uh, you could see the way things were building. They were, uh, you know, they were, they were, yes, they had some good guys coming down from, from the Marlies and, and the Leafs organization, but I think they had good leadership. So uh, again, that's all keys and great goaltending. So uh, these are all staples of, uh, of, of championship teams. And, and almost put your fan hat on for me for a second. Obviously, this being the, the first in the province's history in terms of a hockey championship being won in our own province. From that perspective, kind of what was your reaction? Like, were, were you watching the last games? Kind of as a, as a fan of, of hockey in your own province, that must have been kind of awesome for you too. Well, I was actually there for Game Six, the game that they uh, they won the championship. So uh, it was, it, yeah, I was, and uh, I got to meet a few uh, old friends from the ECHL uh, in, in the front office. Uh, got to see Patrick Kelly and, uh, yeah. and the gang over there, and Ryan uh, Ryan Creeland was there, the the commissioner, the new commissioner. So uh, that was nice. But again, yeah, being there and being able to witness that it gives you goosebumps. Uh, I don't, you know, at whatever level, but especially being in your home province. And how important it is to, um, you know, show people uh, the pride and the, uh, you know, the way we, we we treat our athletes and that type of thing. Again, whether it was the AHL, the NHL, or the ECHL, it doesn't matter. Uh, winning a championship is hard enough as it is, but doing it in your own building in your own province with uh, a handful of locals, uh, guys from Newfoundland on that team, I must say it was it was great to uh, it was great to witness and it was very. Uh, very, pri- very, very filled with pride for myself and everybody else. I think. So I'm going to jump in. Uh, we had a Q and A question come through our Facebook page for you from one uh, Pat Rice asking, and uh, this is a good comparison, I think, to lead into uh, pumping your tires and talking about your playing days in the ECHL. How has the caliber of players in the ECHL changed from your days, say, when you started with Dayton, uh, compared to say what you saw out of the Growlers last season? So. When I first started with Dayton, uh, uh, most it was mostly kids coming out of college, U.S. college. Okay. And uh, you guys that were coming out of U.S. college that wanted to try a bit of uh, professional hockey, uh, take that. That was nineteen. Uh, that was nineteen ninety one, nineteen ninety one. When I I ended up going to Europe for a couple of years and came back. And I guess it was 95, 96, so I ended up going to Raleigh as a player assistant coach. Right. I think that's when it, it kind of changed that um, the NHL team started getting on board. So I remember having one guy uh, in 1991 in my, in my rookie year that was actually sent down from uh, St. Louis, which was our farm team. We were a farm team for St. Louis and Peoria. Okay. Uh, compared to 1995, 96 in Raleigh, they, we had like 10 guys sent down, and we actually had two affiliates. We were affiliated with New Jersey and with Vancouver. So we were getting guys down from both. Okay. Um, the level then, back then, probably not as good as it is now because it's a different game. For sure. But uh, we still had 12, 12 pros or 12 or 13 guys that were signed NHL contracts or AHL contracts. Very similar. So, so it, was, it was good hockey. It, it was starting to get a lot better. Uh, but now, obviously, the game has changed. Uh, you think about back then, there, there was a red line. Um, there was, uh, <laughs> you know, now there's great no, point. Right? right? So if, if there's a red line, the game has to slow down. You can't do the things that you do now. But uh, skill-wise, uh, players were as good. Uh, obviously, Chris, the big thing was toughness. It was, uh, it was just a totally different game. Um, like I, I told uh, several people that... Um, you know, looking at penalty minutes now, uh, geez, I see most most ECHL teams back back when I played, they they amassed close to three thousand, four thousand penalty minutes in a season. That's incredible. Um, I, yeah, and again, it, it comes down to the type of type of game. Not that it was slow; it was just that there were a lot of penalties, and it was just a tougher game. Now you look at uh, J- uh, James, who had uh, hundred and James is a throwback to that age. Everybody else, I don't think anybody else had more than 50 penalty minutes last year. I think you're right. So, you're spot on. Yeah. So, again, uh, to answer Pat's question, I, I think the, the, the skill skill level was there, Pat, but, again, the um, the speed of the game was not the same. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't a clutch-and-grab type of game, but it was, uh, you know, the, the, the skill was there, but you were kind of hand uh, uh, hamstring because of that red line and uh, God, I would have loved to have played without a red line. It would have been a, you know, you could you could take off and get that pass and then keep going. But 
<laughs> everything every, everything was centered around going to the red line and going across. So that was, uh, and that was in, the, in those days. That's kind of dangerous because you're going in the getting caught in the, the train tracks, right? No, exactly. That's a great point. I never would have thought of that, that the red line would have been that impactful, but I guess you're, you're right. And this is a good segue yep. into into bringing in uh, a bit of a career retrospective for yourself as, as with not even arguably, you absolutely are the most successful Newfoundland ECHLer. So we're definitely, uh, we're the ones to pick your brains about that. The Dayton Bombers is when you started in the ECHL in 91-92, and your numbers were ridiculous. 69 goals and 119 points for First All-Star team, Rookie of the Year, and somehow only second in league scoring. What do you remember about your inaugural ECHL campaign? Um, well, I came in, you know, I, I had uh, I had a great junior career. My last couple of years, I scored 50 goals in, in Cornwall and uh, had some great success. Um, never had an opportunity to sign with Detroit, who I was drafted by. So That's I ended right. up going to Acadia, Acadia for two years. And um, I just said, you know what, I have one opportunity to do this. So uh, unfortunately, I left Acadia after my second year and decided to turn pro. And um, I went in and I was, I think I was at my, at my best and at my prime. So yeah. I remember telling the guy that uh, was at training camp in, uh, in uh, Dayton once I got there. So I said, you know what, I'm going to score 50 here. Uh, and this guy looked at me and said, what? You're going to score 50 goals? Like, and anyway, uh, you know, I, I had I had thirty five before Christmas, so it was just it was just a fun time. Like, uh, imagine Chris, you're going into every rink and you they announce how many goals you've got going every time you score a goal, and people look around. And go, this guy's got forty odd goals in January. Like, <laughs> what the hell is going? On? You know. So it was kind of that was kind of wow. cool because I, I'm not saying that the league wasn't as good uh, as it was five, four or five years later, but. Yeah, it was, it was. I was in my prime, and I was a scorer, and I got opportunities to play with a couple of good players. And uh, again, we, we we all pretty much lit it up. But uh, uh, again, it's not uh, demeaning the league, but it was a tough league. Like you, if you were going to score, you had to go to the front of the net. You had to take the take the abuse, and you know, again, I, we were kind of used to that as uh, coming from the OHL and, right. and 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 college hockey and that. But again, that's what you have to do to score. But you know, it was it was a great season, great crowds. Like it was incredible because it was kind of like a, a reintroduction to hockey to some of these communities. Because this was Dayton, ironically, it was this was Dayton's first year back in the league in a long time. They used to have the Dayton Gems, which is back in the old IHL. Right. And uh, I this was Dayton's inaugural season. I actually ended up being on uh, a couple of inaugural teams in my tenure in the, in the coast. Huh. Uh, but uh, it was pretty cool. So we were getting great crowds. We, then we go into Cincinnati, no different than it is today, 10,000 fans. In the Absolutely. In great fan base currently in Cincinnati. Right. Uh, Birmingham, Louisiana, like all of these teams were, they were packing 10 grand into the into their buildings. Wow. Their teams were treated like NHL stars. Like they, they go out and couldn't, nobody could, you couldn't buy your own meal. It was wherever you went, you were, you know, it was very strange, actually. It's kind of like huh. living in, Toronto or, or Montreal when these guys walk down the street, but you'd be going through the mall and they'd go, hey, aren't you? And you'd say, yeah, but I'm just a hockey bomb. I'm not a, you know, I'm just in the ECHL. I'm not a, any, but they, that's the way they treated it. So it was a kind of a cool experience. So yeah, that first year was, was one to remember and, uh, you know, something that you cherish uh, for a long time. No, absolutely. 69 goals. Did you have, do you have any super memorable games? Did you have one game where you had like six or seven or something? No, I never had the big one. Um, I never had, I, I've had, I had games where I had three and four. Sure. Uh, I never had, uh, I, you know, I had a couple five or six point games, but you know, again, I was, I was a shooter, yeah. but again, there was, I, I think, I can't remember, I don't know if it was that year or the next, but the the, net, the other year I scored six and nine, I rattled off uh Two or three hat tricks in a, in a row, and no. uh, you know, yeah, yeah, and it was it was just surreal. Like you're going in, and you're just as a goal scorer, you go in, you shoot the puck from behind the net, and it just goes in. You're like guys would look at you and go, "Are you kidding me?" Like just <laughs> just crazy luck. Uh, and in order to score that many, you've got to have some luck. Oh, but, for sure. Uh, but I again, I, I shot a lot. So again, most a lot of guys frowned upon shooting from everywhere. But I said, you know what? You're not going to score if you don't shoot. So you know what? I shot. <laughs> so that's what I, that's what I did, and and I ended up being lucky sometimes, but also catching guys off guard as well. 
Yeah, no kidding. So the very next season, you split that one between Dayton and the Richmond Renegades. Uh, was that a trade? Uh, how did you How did you end up in Richmond? Yeah, I ended up getting traded. Um, it was uh, I was I was under contract actually with Peoria. Okay. And um, I was uh, Peoria was in the IHL at that point. Right. So after that good first season, I ended up going to Peoria. And um, I, I never got much action up in Peoria, really. So I just said, you know what, I, I, I want to move on here. Things weren't going great in, in Dayton. Uh, Darren Langman actually came with me that year. Yeah. And he ended up staying that Yeah, he came, I brought him, he came with me down to that uh, that training camp in Peoria. And we roomed together. And uh, that's another story in itself. But <laughs> uh, uh, he they basically fought his way out of the ECHL and then fought his way into the AHL, fought his way out of the AHL and into the NHL again in three years. So it was pretty amazing Incredible. to watch. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I ended up in, in Richmond and uh, ended up turning uh, the season around and had a half-decent year. And the following year, I think I scored 69 again. Like so, But it was just, you know, not saying that you're a suitcase, but you, you just uh, you get comfortable in a place and then things happen things change and you're like okay my career is too short here i want to move on and get get another opportunity here and that's basically what happened no for sure and sometimes you, you need that you have to shake it up and and actually your point about langdon kind of can lead me into another q a question here from ryan howell asking how do you feel about hockey essentially moving away from fighting does it put more pressure on the refs to make sure the game stays under control how effective is that compared to players holding each other accountable because and and rightly or wrongly i think the echl back in the day and i don't know if it was necessarily back in your day but it was known or at least has the bad reputation as having been a goon league uh do you believe that to be fair and uh, and what do you think of i guess the state of fighting in the game as we stand today yeah that's and, that, and chris you know yourself that's a loaded question because oh yeah you ask, you ask any player in in the game today whether it's, it's the echl the hl or the nhl uh i think players police the game best i'm not saying you need 10 10 of these guys on your team but you need you need at least one that has some ability to uh, to step in there and, uh, and 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 do things that need to be done. Absolutely, uh, I like I like the game where it is right now. I just I, I'm just not happy about stick work. I'm not happy about the guy skating 30 miles an hour and then uh, hitting a guy not ready for it. Uh, and again, that comes down to the speed and, and the uh, and the red uh, the red line being uh, taken away. So. Uh, but to answer the question, fighting, I, I still think it has a place in the game, but not to the point of the way it was before it was, geez, when I, we came up through, it, was, it wasn't a good lead, but there, everybody was fairly tough and ready to go when needed to be. And I've been out there when all five guys drop the gloves and say, okay, boys, this is what has to be done. Um, yeah. does, does that, does that sound like hockey? No, but that, unfortunately that's the way it was played. When someone starts getting embarrassed in their own building, it's going to happen. And um, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, players take it into their own hands every now and then. Actually, I've been watching some of the highlights. There have been a few more fights this year than I had expected. Huh. And uh, again, and that's in the NHL. So uh, it still happens. But again, I think uh, players police it a little bit better. And to your point, Chris, I think referees are put on the spot quite a bit with respect to trying to keep this no fighting thing under wraps because they're going to get themselves hurt as well because guys jumping in there trying to stop something in the middle in the middle of it they're only going to get themselves hurt so i think the referees and the linesmen have to start thinking about their own health when they're trying to jump into flying fists before just before something gets going so no i I like the game where it is but I, i think players still are able to police the game I think that's uh, very well said. You have to have some accountability uh, by, you know, from your peers, and uh, that means sometimes uh, the big fella on the other bench, but uh, that is sometimes what's going to be required. I'm going to pick your brain moving forward here on uh, from 93 94. You were spot on as another 69 goals, 104 points, and 100 pims. But what I'm going to hone in on here is one game played with the St. John's Maple Leafs. Uh, how, how did that come about? One game, uh, you didn't play a ton in the American League in your career. You got a game in with the Baby Leafs in your home province. Tell us how that happened. Yeah, again, it just stemmed from having a great season. And uh, I was I was on my way home, and I got a call from, uh, I don't know if it was Joel Quenville or it uh, might have been Glenn Stanford. And, and uh, whoever was coaching there at the time, because I had been there a couple years before, 
uh, after that first season when uh, I got called up to um, Binghamton at the end of the season after my after my first year and had a had a good playoff. I, I spent a bit of time in St. John's when Binghamton got knocked out because St. John's then got the bye into the final the year that they lost the Calder Cup to uh, Adirondack. Right. Um, I ended up spending almost a week and a half there because they brought myself back and Slaney and a bunch of other guys, Dwayne Norris, I think we all played, and they invited us in to spend a week and a half to keep those guys in shape. So wow. uh, that was that was fun. So again, once they saw that I think I had another good season, they brought me back to uh, have a game. Uh, it didn't amount to much. Uh, they were just I, I I don't know if they were just looking to fill a spot. I was I was near there, so they said, okay, well we got a guy here who played pro hockey, so let's get him out for a game. But other than that, I went in and had a chat with uh, the head coach, and he said, well we're we can't sign you to anything right now. He said, but. Uh, uh, we'd be interested in training camp or something. I said, okay, well, we'll we'll be in touch over the summer, and nothing ever became of it. But that's that's just the way it goes. Oh, well, that, that's that's how she goes. Do, do you remember? Was the game at home in St. John's then? Like, did you have anybody was, in the crowd? Yeah, well, I had actually. I was, uh, was at Memorial Stadium, and uh, I can remember because uh, again, I'm I'm. I'm just, I'm just a big enemy in St. John's due to the uh, baseball part of part of my life. That well. uh, I can remember after uh, just just showing up at the rink and there was people waiting there saying, "I heard you were playing." I had to come down and say hello and all this kind of stuff. So it was pretty neat that you know friends from uh, the summertime, my baseball uh, past, were were all waiting for me to show up to shake hands and say, "Oh my God, I hope you have a great game." That type of thing, but. Uh, going back to playing in St. John, it would have been pretty cool to be able to play pro hockey in your own province. Again, you walk around, I remember uh, just watching, uh, you know, like Terry, uh, Ryan, and, and, and Gilly, and those guys, when they played with the Leafs, the, you know, they, they were the mayor, and, and they walked around, and, and, and everybody knew who they were, and it was fun to play there, and uh, especially when you have good teams. That's what makes it so much fun, and uh, takes it back to last year. Those guys walking around town, my God, I... I got to hang out with them a little bit this summer when yeah. the Spit and Chicklets crowd came around, and uh, these guys are, uh, you know, they're they're royalty now. Uh, it's not very often that happens, so that's that's what's so uh, so neat about winning that thing uh, in the home province. No, no kidding. I made the joke with James Melindy on our first episode. I'm sure he hasn't had to buy a beer since uh, since he got here. I, I'm confident in that. Yeah, well, again, James is not that kind of guy. You know that. No, so, but he, but in yeah, terms of the but again, status, no, he shouldn't have to. No, again, when someone wins like that, I, and I don't know if times have changed in that regard, but Jesus, James is your captain of your your winning team in an odd real season. No, he shouldn't have to. Whether that's whether that's a deal through a brewery or a bar or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> my God, you you should walk in and just go to the, give them the old mafia fingers, and you should have a, a tray in front of you. That's the. <laughs> right, that's how I want to live my life one day. Don't know what I have to do to reach Bob Cole levels to do that, but uh, yeah, it, really, yeah. So in any case, ninety four, ninety five, ninety five, ninety six for you. You headed overseas to Germany. Uh, I just want you to to put into words your numbers there. Over two years, eighty two games played, one hundred and twelve goals, one hundred and forty four assists for two hundred and fifty six points. Obviously, the ECHL this was not, but just how explain how one person and scores 112 goals in 82 games in a brand new country. It's called a lot of ice time, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, no. So, so when you when you go to Germany, uh, this wasn't the DEL or the Deutsche League league. It was this was this was Division Two. So uh, it's still good good league, but sure. it, it's I guess what we would call two line hockey now. So your 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 top two lines are, are a mix of you have only allowed to have two imports. Uh, two Canadians okay. uh, or Americans or whatever, uh, and everybody else fills in. You're either a European from Europe or you are what's called uh, you know, a carded player. So back in the early late 80s, early 90s, a lot of these top high-end pros or, or junior guys went to Europe. If they had any bit of European background at all, they were considered. They could get a, a, what's called the European card. Right. And the really good teams over there loaded up on these guys, so that allowed them to pay them. Uh, you're only allowed to have two imports, so obviously the more European cards you have, the better team you're going to have. Now, I'm not, you know, going and saying that European players in Germany were weren't as good, but they weren't. They, they <laughs> you know, if you can get eight Canadians on your team as opposed to two, then you were going to have success team. with those guys. Yeah, exactly, and and that's what two or three teams did. But my team only brought myself uh, and another. Uh, actually, it was Dennis Holland. Uh, 
uh, Ken Holland's uh, younger brother. Yeah. So Dennis Holland and I, we had a couple, we had one good year, and another guy, Guy Phillips, unfortunately, he passed away this past uh, year with a brain tumor. He uh, he was a superstar in, in Medicine Hat and uh, also played pro with me in Richmond, yeah. and that's how we got to go over together that first year. So, But again, yeah, to go back to your 112 goals, a lot of ice time, a lot of power play, and you're you're doing everything. You're a regular shift, penalty kill, uh, power play, and uh, again, you, you're only you're only as good as the guys you play with. So I got to play with a pretty good player as well. So we lit it up that first year. No kidding, you did. Uh, and what was it? You, Duisburg, Germany. Kind of where is that? And yeah. uh, and uh, what kind of a town was that? Duisburg was pretty neat. It was uh, it, it was in western uh, western Germany, uh, almost right on the uh, the Holland border. So. Uh, the biggest center close to that would be either uh, Dusseldorf or uh, Cologne, but I only had to drive 45 minutes to get to uh, to Fenlo, which was which which is in Holland. And cool. honestly, Holland Holland was pretty neat because as soon as you walked into anywhere in Holland and they knew you were Canadian, you were you were considered golden because obviously we live uh, the Canadians liberated Holland in the in the Second World War, so. You know, you go in there and you, they just knew that uh, if you had anything Canadian on your, your shirt or your coat or whatever, they, they actually said thank you. Like, it was incredible. Like, the people still have the memory of Canadians liberating that country. That's wild. I never would have assumed yeah. that. That's yeah. neat. But, uh, no, Deuce, Deuce, Deuceburg was a really nice place. It was, uh, again, their... Uh, they do their Christmas outside, so everything every from December first to Christmas Day, they uh, they have what's called a, a Christmas market or Vinox market. You go outside, and they got the blue wine. Uh, it's it's just it's every kind of pastry and, and food and sh- sh- uh, uh, Schwein and uh, all the, yeah. the big hot dogs. Uh, well, you know that that's incredible. And, and and again, as soon as you step outside, you can smell it right through the town. And it's uh, it's a pretty amazing place. And uh, they they treated us like we were uh, we were family and assimilation was kind of hard. But uh, learning sure. the, learning the language in that first year was tough. But uh, that's that's part of a new culture. But a very strong people like they are very strong in their ways and, and uh, you know they they love their sports whether it's hockey or soccer or, or anything. But uh, it was a great introduction to Europe for me because uh, it was it was an amazing experience. Myself, my wife got to go and and uh, got to learn the culture. No, oh, that's so cool, and uh, it sounds very delicious. Uh, you decided, it looks like, to return to the ECHL at the end of the 95-96 season with the Rally Ice Camps and torched it up there at the end of the year, uh, 41 points in 36 games. Uh, why the decision to come back to the ECHL? Surely at that point, uh, I don't know if there, you had other options, but why back to the coast? Um, actually, it was. Uh, I spent half a year in Germany. Things were, were going okay, but I didn't see myself sticking it out much longer in Europe. So I had an opportunity. I got a call from uh, uh, Raleigh to step in as a player assistant coach. So okay. back back in the day in the ECHL, I, and I don't know if it still goes that way, it, once you sign a player assistant coach card, then you're given the, uh, not a carte blanche, but I guess you're the ability to get paid a, a lot more. Oh. So, uh, and you don't, you did, it didn't really count for the cap. So that was my opportunity to jump back to the, uh, to the, the the Americas and right. uh, get closer closer to reality, I guess, and just say, okay, here's here's an opportunity now to start thinking about coaching because again, I was, you know, in, in 95, 96, you're looking at your your you're in your late twenties, almost thirty years old, so um, it's it's time to start thinking about life after hockey. Um, and I got an opportunity to jump in into a a spot where they uh, were able to pay me a little bit more and. and uh, you know, just to learn some of the, the coaching uh, aspects of the game. So, yeah, that's what I did and then uh, stayed there for, for a couple of years, actually. Yeah, what was Rally like as a hockey market then compared to what we know uh, know it as now? Um, we played in the old fairgrounds, actually. It was like a, it was like a miniature saddle dome. Uh, oh. It was right on the uh, – Raleigh is the capital of North Carolina, so it's uh, really – you know, it's, it's a small, big town. Uh, we were actually out in Cary, which is uh, actually where a lot of the players, uh, Car- the Canes, live now. But huh. it, it was before, obviously it was before the uh, Carolina Hurricanes came to uh, the NHL. So that was the reason we ended up leaving. Uh, the year I left was uh, moved to uh, in '98. We had to go to Augusta. That's because Raleigh, the, the Hurricanes, were coming in. So uh, oh. that was done, right. So at that point, the, the Hurricanes weren't there, obviously. But uh, it was it was good crowds. There was um, you know we had some good teams there. Um, 
Uh, my brother lives in Winston-Salem, which was uh, two and a half hours uh, west of there, so I uh, got to see him quite a bit, so that was nice. And, um, no, it's, that's a lot of the reason why I, I did jump to Raleigh. It was, uh, and, again, it's uh, fairly nice in the winter. and nothing. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, nothing. you could say that all you want, but it, was that an appeal to you, obviously, to get to play in the warm weather? Well, again, I, you know, Chris, as you get older, you're supposed to get smarter. Again, I started <laughs> off in Dayton. Supposed to. Started, yeah, I started off in Dayton and then I moved down to Richmond. Richmond is obviously in Virginia, so that's that's getting uh, a little more southern. Then I moved away to the, uh, you know, to Europe and that type of thing. But then when I came back, I said I want to start moving south. Uh, ideally, you know, obviously North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, uh, the Panhandle, something like that, just to enjoy that little bit. Well the last few years that I knew I had playing and it turned out really good because road trips down that way um, you're waking up on a beach uh, a different beach every day so that was the that was the allure of playing in the ECHL in the southern division back then yeah. was uh, you're, you're heading to Florida you get Pensacola Tallahassee and then you go straight across into Mississippi uh, Alabama and it's all on the beach right Oh my God! Yeah, here uh, not uh, not quite the same appeal to come to Newfoundland and head to Middle Cove Beach in February, but uh, we'll we'll leave yeah. that one as it stands. <laughs> uh, what was Augusta like to play in, and uh, how close did you get to playing Augusta National? Well, that's a good question because Augusta was a was again that was a uh, that was an inaugural season as well because we we had just moved from um, from Raleigh. And I'm not saying we were kicked out of Raleigh, but again, two 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 pro teams aren't going to last in, in that market. For sure. Uh, so they they made that decision to make the jump to Augusta, Georgia. Going in, it was great, great support, good hockey team, and uh, again, we had a real real good tough team. We had lots of support from uh, Vancouver and Jersey because we still had that uh, support, and uh, we had ten or eleven guys under contract, so we were good and we were tough. Augusta, I never got to play it. Uh, again, you either in order to get on there you either had to be uh, invited by a member uh, or a letter you know, from god just, something like that right now again you know what if i really sucked up enough i probably could have found someone to say come on let take me there take me there but again throughout the season uh, you're you're, you're kind of like okay they actually shut that place down in the summer nobody even plays that in the summer it's it's only during the spring and the and, and the winter that they play on it in the summertime that's when that's their growing season that's when they fix it up so it's kind of a, a different different bird when it comes to golf courses. I did get to walk the par three, uh, so I watched the par Ooh. three championship on Wednesday. This was the year that ninety nine was the year Olafable won, and uh, I got to, I got to walk the course on Thursday. So it was pretty neat. You could pretty much take your shoes off, just like it was your carpet oh on your, in your uh, in your house walking that. So it was pretty neat to see the uh, the first day of of the old timers, the uh, the legends of golf teeing off and. That was that was pretty awesome. Uh, again, you look at these guys, and uh, you said these these guys have been here for thirty, forty years playing, and they're they're here now in their sixties, seventies, and eighties, uh, still banging it out there. So that was pretty neat. No kidding. No, I had to ask just as a golf nut myself. And is the course even the par three? Is it everything you hoped it would be and more? It's like the mecca of oh, golf. Yeah, and again, you, you can't it is, you can't do it justice by explaining what it looked like. It was. It was just like it was carved into that landscape for for that p- particular reason. But um, strangely enough, you drive down the main road there, and the only thing that to really signify that, that that Augusta National was there was a small, well, the same as the the, the flags that they have for the Masters, yeah. a small white sign with Augusta National, and that was it. And you'd never know because all along the main drag, it was just huge, these huge trees that just you so you couldn't see anything. So it was just like a. You know, if you were to knock those trees down, it would look like a big farm because it was just it was just set so far in, yeah. and uh, it was it was it was, it was yeah it was uh, sheltered from everything else. But uh, yeah, it was like not a whole lot of uh, community involvement from the course that type of thing. They were, right. You know, their thing was very private. And, Certainly, uh, no. I had to ask the question. Yeah. That's the only association yeah. I have with Augusta is the golf course, and obviously the previous uh, ECHL team. There, surely, I'm going to ask that question. So, after your uh, time in Augusta, after another good year at almost a point per game pace, after 98, 99, you decided to hang them up at least as far as the professional career uh, was concerned. Why at that point, when you're seemingly uh, still able to produce at a high rate? Um, the ironic, the funny thing about that season, Chris, was I had an opportunity to stick around and play and come back as a player coach, but 
uh, I said, well, I don't think I want to, to do that uh, again. I, I didn't think my playing career was going to go any, any, any further. Sure. Uh, and honestly, I was not. And, and to put a, a caveat there is I retired that year one goal away from the all-time record. And I said, you know what? My mind is made up. I, I could come back and, and score a goal or two and take over the all-time scoring record. I said, no, screw it. I just, you know what? I know in my heart I broke it anyway with it respect the goals called off or posts or whatever it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I said, you know what, it would have been nice to say that you were the all-time leading goal scorer for, for, for five minutes, but uh, again, it just didn't mean uh, that much to, uh, again, you score goals, you score goals. It's not a matter right. of someone's going to you at some point. But um, yeah, that year I just said, you know what, I, I, I'm done. I, I just don't want to coach right now. A uh, little disgruntled with, uh, with the game. And I said, you know what, I can always come back. And uh, I said, you know what, I'll be back, but no, it didn't happen. Uh, sometimes I wish I did, uh, but I, I do not regret coming home and, and letting my uh, family and my parents and uh, the wife's parents see their their kid and and the, and the grow uh, and let him grow up here. So it's been it's been great for that. No, absolutely, and that's a perfect segue into our uh, next segment, our Growlerville segment, where every week we highlight the great hockey communities around the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, because, hey, after all, we're not the St. John's Growlers. We are the Newfoundland Growlers, after all. And uh, after you finished uh, your professional career, uh, you went home and started a pretty legendary senior hockey career in your hometown of Cornerbrook. We'll get to that, but just sum up, if you can, for me, Cornerbrook as a hockey town. I know it as a hockey Hockey town, but from someone who's from there, who's seen, you know, the the hockey landscape across North America, what makes uh, Cornerbrook a special place as a hockey town? Well, Cornerbrook is 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 truly the senior hockey town. Like uh, again, it's it's a shame to say it, it it's it it has a hard time following anything but senior hockey. If you throw throw a game of senior hockey in in, in the old Hummer Gardens, and you automatically have fifteen hundred to two thousand people hanging from the rafters. Um, they, they couldn't do that for junior. They couldn't do it for midget. They couldn't do it for college. Whatever it is that the allure is for senior hockey, that's, that's what it was. But Cornerbrook is truly a hockey town. Uh, it has been since 1935 when they won the first herder, uh, which is the, uh, the trophy given away for senior supremacy in Newfoundland. So again, they, and it, it was, I guess, it, I guess it got to its height in the mid '80s, where uh, Cornerbrook actually went on to, w- to win the Allen Cup, be the first one from Newfoundland to do that. And uh, it was it was it was pro hockey then, Chris. It was oh, yeah. uh, people it was, again. It was it was second to none with respect to these guys. All played in the AHL. Uh, all came right out of college hockey or uh, or Europe, and uh, it, it was just as good or better than the AHL at that point. Again, money money costs money for, for these guys, so it just it got carried away. But anyway, no, uh, coming through here, playing senior hockey in your hometown, uh, I'm not saying it's at the height of playing pro hockey, but uh, senior hockey in your hometown, everybody knows who you are. Uh, again, uh, it's you don't get a chance to, uh, to live off of your wins as much as you get to hear it about your losses because <laughs> uh, it's about pride. It's community pride, man, because you win all you're supposed to win. But if you lose, what the hell happened? So, again, uh, you're accountable in your own community, and whether that's working or, or hockey or anything you do. But uh, that's what I found the greatest, uh, and the rivalries, obviously, with Deer Lake and, and Stephenville and Port of Basque, and Grand Falls and Clarenville later on. But uh, Cornerbrook and Deer Lake, they're uh, 50 kilometers apart. Obviously, you know, you, you guys of have course. had uh, a, bit, a bit of training camp in each building, and there's a hate-hate relationship for both those communities with respect to senior hockey after the, the glory days of the 80s because when it, when I came home it was uh, it was then myself and Gillingham and Terry Ryan and then and then in uh, 2005 I think Langer showed up and then everything right. changed and it uh, you know he just brought that uh, tough mentality to Deer Lake and again it was just rivalry we were putting 2500 3000 fans in the Incredible. building when Cornerbrook and Deer Lake when Cornerbrook and Deer Lake would uh, would go out there so uh, again those and that's still going on so uh, kudos to uh, the fans who keep coming out and uh, to be able to get a half decent brand of hockey to get people out of their homes on Friday and Saturday that's what Cornerbrook is about and uh, they still hope for that no, absolutely, and and this is actually a, another good tie into another uh, Q and A question we have here from Sean R F. Some people dismissed the ECHL as an equivalent to senior hockey. 
Has the ECHL always had a lack of respect, and has it become more respected as uh, as pro hockey since? So kind of a hybrid question here. I, I think senior hockey gets a bad rep for being a goon league the same way, or maybe historically, the same way that maybe the ECHL has. Maybe try and, try and help me draw the line between the two here. I think what the question is getting at is people see the ECHL as a place where washed up pros or guys who had their hopes and dreams dashed go to play, but from what you've seen from the Growlers, I think you'd agree that the ECHL is not what you think senior hockey is, and what you think senior hockey is is not what it actually is. Is that fair to say, you yeah. think? Very fair, Chris, because, again, and it's a great question or a great comment, because um, I think the stigma of the, the old ECHL, uh, you know, everybody goes, oh, my God, that slap shot, that's all you're doing is fighting, that type of thing. Um, again, uh, that's Hollywood, and, and again, that's that's what happened. But d- don't get me wrong; that league was tough, and it's, it, it was tougher than uh, it is now. But the game has changed. Uh, to compare it to senior hockey, you're right. Senior hockey is where old guys go to die. So again, <laughs> but that's they're there. But senior hockey is there because of the pride for community. It might be an opportunity for some leagues that they might make some money, that type of thing. But when it all comes down to it, Chris, it's for entertainment for fans. It's, uh, it, it's, it, in the end, it's about pride, pride for your hometown, pride for your, who you're cheering for, that type of thing. So to answer that question, uh, ECHL has been given a bad name because of its past. Right. And, and now you're looking at it's the way it's been put now. It's, it's that double A, triple A mentality of, Hey, let's get the kids in there early, let them play, and then they can move their way up. Now, right now, you've got guys there that are 19, 20 years old. You've also got guys there that are 30. You've got guys that are 25. So they're all at different stages, but they all help each other. Yeah. The young guys push the old guys. The old guys teach the young guys. So that's how it is in the East NHL. Hence the name change. They wanted to get away from the East Coast Hockey League and change it to the ECHL because they want to try and put a different moniker on it. I don't know when they're going to change it to another league to make it more encompassing of not just East Coast, but... But that, that's, that's up to them. I'm not a marketer when it comes to that type of thing. But it's, uh, again, I, yeah, you're right. I think they've been given that stigma because of the past. But uh, it's certainly not that way anymore. No, certainly it's not. And thank you to Sean RF for that question. Uh, looking back again, uh, back to the corner brook angle, uh, what did it mean to you to, uh, you won a herder in 02? That was with the Royals, was it not? Yeah, it was. That was uh, Again, you remember every championship. And, and it's just, it doesn't matter what league you play in because, I don't know many people have ever had a chance to win any championships, but it doesn't matter whether it's a senior or a pro or it doesn't matter what league. You always think about the things you went through. And that, again, when you do it for your hometown, even better. No, absolutely. And uh, the number 25 hanging in the rafters out there now, what did that mean to you, your hometown, place where you you know, you know, cut your teeth and got to come home to and, and continue to find success? What did it mean to see your jersey in the rafters there? Again, that's that's something that comes after, uh, you know, someone obviously has made a, a point of, of saying you deserve something. I, again, to, to have your jersey and hanging in the rafters with your number and your name on it is it's surreal just to even think about it and have a box uh, with your with your career in it uh, hanging in the ring. It's just, again, do you think you deserve it? No. Is it an honor? Surely. It's just something that you never, ever think, uh, playing as a youngster in Cornwall, Newfoundland, that you'd walk into a, an arena and, and see your name hanging there as people are walking around and, and go, oh, who's this guy? And there are, you know, people that know you, have known you since you've been five years old. So that that's the neat thing about that. You think about the work that you put in and, and the amount of fun that you had doing it. That's what makes it so uh, so much uh, more gratifying when you when you see it there. No, absolutely. And uh, a couple more questions before we let you scoot here. We're on with Darren Colburn here. And what, what's Corner Brook like as a hockey town now? I know I've been kind of out of the senior loop. I used to cover senior for the Packet newspaper in Clarenville in the early 2010s, but uh, those days are behind me. What's the senior landscape and the hockey landscape like right now in uh, in Corner Brook? Well, we're, we're geared and ready to go. Um, again, there's a lot of... A lot of negativity surrounding senior hockey in general right now in the province. And, and, and again, I'm not going to get into this. No, no, no. I'm not asking going, you to sling going. any mud. Yeah. yeah. But I, mean, I tell you what, people are just dying to see hockey here. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and it's local hockey. It's no, nobody's getting paid. Uh, guys are coming out for their uh, out of their own good goodwill and, and, and coming here. You know, yes, you're, you're getting a couple sticks and, and you're playing, working hard and practice once a week. And you play Friday and Saturday night, one on the road and one at home. 
But uh, you know, we're average, we last year we averaged fifteen hundred to two thousand fans. So get out, uh, yeah. So it's and again, it's not as it's not as good as it used to be. Like I said, back in the glory days, but fans are, are taking a liking to the fact that guys care, and then it's not just go out there and you protect your paycheck and I'll protect mine. It's go out there and and, and put it on the line, and, and it's guys that probably wouldn't get a chance to play at that level if if there were paid players because uh, they'd be the guys watching rather than out there playing. So let's just say the compete level is there and so is the the pride level. So it's great to see. You know, that's that's all you can hope for, especially, you know, in a, in a town, not the biggest, uh, you know, city in the world, but you got to, that entertainment is so integral to that community that that's, uh, no, it's always certainly good to hear. And next time I'm on the West Coast in the middle of hockey season, don't know when that's going to be, but I'll have to make my way out there. Darren Colburn, ECHL Hall of Famer. Before I let you go, I've got to ask you about that. What was it like to be, uh, you know, obviously the league in which you spent most of your uh, professional career to be recognized back in, in 2015 there? Uh, what did that mean to you? That's that's huge. Yeah, again, Chris. You, yeah, you, same you answer. <laughs> Talk about Hall of Fame again. Someone must have thought enough of what you gave to the league, and that's what it means to me. Is that you? You, you stuck it out in a, in a league that, yeah, you probably didn't think you're going to get an opportunity to uh, to move up any further. And I came back a couple times, and you know, like you said, we put up, I put up some good numbers, and uh, they felt good enough to to say, you know what, this guy here is in the in the top whatever uh, this has ever played this league. So that's the gratifying thing about that. Is uh, I look back at all the guys that were voted into the Hall of Fame, and I'm like, wow, just to be in with these guys. Because, again, you say it's ECHL, but these guys at some point in their career all had an opportunity to move on into the NHL or did play in the NHL right. or had or some damn good hockey players. So just to be in that class and, and to be recognized was just uh, was everything that uh, what it meant to me. So, uh, again, yeah, it's, it's just surreal that you, uh, a kid from Newfoundland, gets to be in any Hall of Fame, let alone uh, the one down uh, in the ECHL as big as it was. No, absolutely. Any they always say from at all levels of hockey, oh the real the real good stories come at, come out of the minor leagues cuz you're coddled too much in the in the show. That being said, do you have any like any crazy stories of anything that happened in in different rinks around the ECHL before we let you go? Anything jump to mind that oh yeah, this real East Coast thing happened in X barn at X time. Anything anything nuts that you can uh, share with us? Well, the nuts the nuttiest thing that ever happened to me, and this here is, uh, and as ironically, it was in the Southern Arena. I was in Roanoke, and uh, it was in the middle of March, and it, I was with Richmond at the time. And we're sitting in the rink, and I think there was five people in the building at the time only, oh, because boy. it was the worst snowstorm of the East in, in, in centuries on the East Coast of the what? U.S., so we were already in town. We were staying right next door to the Roanoke, uh, the, the auditorium there. And um, we basically went to the rink and we said, okay, well, the referees are here. The teams are here. Let's play. And I think other than the goal judges and the guys that were in the penalty box, that was it. That was all that was in that rink. An because empty else, building. An empty building. And honest to God, my parents were in town with my sister, who's down from Calgary. And they had to stay in the hotel because they couldn't. You walked outside your door, you couldn't even see so there, we started playing this building in, in this building uh, partway, and this is all online. You can read this whole story. Partway through the first period, first period or second period, I can't remember what it was. We heard this big crack, and what it was, the main beam holding up the middle of that building broke. So Stop. it was due to all, all the ice and snow that was on top of that building. So referee stopped the game. We were sent right to the dressing room. Didn't even have time to change. We walked out of that rink. Ten minutes later, that building was to the ground. You're joking. Not joking. You can go online. Anybody can go online and see that. Uh, just Roanoke, uh, Roanoke, uh, I forget what it was called. Uh, anyway, it, it, yeah, Roanoke uh, rink collapses. You can go in and just have a look at that. It was in Roanoke, Virginia, in the worst, worst blizzard I've ever seen, even in Newfoundland. And, uh, yeah, ten minutes, ten minutes and would have been on top of us had we not heard that crack from the from the main beam in that building it was incredible so we we went back to the hotel and we said okay that puts a new light on what hockey is all about right there <laughs> no kidding oh my i expected you incredible. to tell me some yeah. story about some guys hacking darts in the locker room or something i didn't expect that that is next no. level stuff wow yeah no Thank no and again that's the 
put your your yeah your life flashes in front of you. Like you said, if, if that hadn't have happened with that big snap of whatever what happened in the ceiling, yeah. it, it could have been on top of us at any time. So yeah, that was pretty pretty surreal. Uh, when no that, kidding. Yeah, when that took place. Oh yeah. my God! Well, I'm glad I asked. Thank you for that, and thank you for uh, all of your time today. Uh, I think uh, that's going to do it here for us on this week's Growlers Nation podcast. So on behalf of all of us, again, Darren Colburn, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. This was great, and uh, down the road uh, we'll have to catch up again. I'm sure you got an extra story or two hidden in there. I do too. Yeah, but <laughs> thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it, and congratulations to you and all your success. You're doing a great job, and go Growlers. There you have it, folks. Go Growlers, and that is going to do it for us. Thank you to all of you for tuning in with us here today, and be sure to tune in for the next episode wherever you found this one. Make sure to comment and rate us and all that stuff so we can continue to produce all this wonderful content for you. I'll be on the air all season long at Mixler.com slash NL Growlers. Make sure you tune in. Until next time, we'll see you around. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Growlers Nation podcast with Chris Ballard. Follow the Growlers all season long on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at NL Growlers. Listen live to all 72 Growlers games on Mixler, M-I-X-L-R dot com slash NL Growlers.